Before we get into today's video guys, I just want to quickly announce that we're moving away from the three videos a week pace that we had going for the past month or two. Myself and my editor have decided it would be best to do one high quality video a week until the channel grows to a point where it's sustainable to make three high quality videos a week. With that said, in order to make that happen, I would very much appreciate if you shared our channel around with your friends and family that are interested in history, and if you have a spare dollar or two, also check out our Patreon. Anyways guys, on to the video. Loss of life and war go hand in hand, and in any war, there are countless decisions made each and every day, both on an individual and governmental level, that can determine the fate of one man or an entire city of people. These decisions are usually justified by the thought that the ultimate good that comes out of victory outweighs the negative of the present moment, and since both sides have opposing views of what that ultimate good is, they each amp up the pressure and brutality to levels considered outright inhumane in peacetime. Although when it comes to World War II, we know a lot about Nazi Germany's decisions on this frontier, we don't know much about England's, and in this video, I aim to highlight one of England's most controversial figures in her history, that man being Arthur Harris, also colloquially known as Bomber Harris or Butcher Harris. Born in 1892, Harris, like many other British boys, was instilled with an innate love for his country and for the crown. Although he was adventurous by nature and ended up moving to southern Rhodesia by age 17, once the news of the First World War broke out, he felt compelled to fight. Initially thinking the war wouldn't last long at all, Harris enlisted into the 1st Rhodesia Regiment as a boogler, which is the simple brass instrument you've probably seen in plenty of movies but didn't know the name of. His regiment was eventually posted in a campaign throughout Southwest Africa, where the combat was admittedly relatively light, with there being only one German aircraft present in the area. By July 1915, the campaign was over, and although Harris felt contented in his service to the Queen for a while, he quickly realised the war in Europe was still raging and contrary to first impressions, would go on for much longer. On the basis of this realisation, he joined the war in Europe as a Rhodesian volunteer and was drafted into the Royal Flying Corps where he got his first taste of flying. Discovering he was quite handy with an aircraft, Harris not only managed to survive the tumultuous early stages of aviation warfare, where mind you, no Britons were given parachutes to wear as it was deemed dishonourable, but he thrived and scored kills on five enemy aircraft, earning him an Air Force Cross after the war. The Western Front, however, did leave a lasting impression on the man, who would later go on to say that air bombing was preferable to the mass slaughter of the trenches. Although Harris wanted to initially return to Rhodesia after World War I, he decided for the sake of the stability of his family, he would instead continue pursuing an Air Force career. In the interwar period between 1918 and 1939, Harris was present in India, Mesopotamia and Persia. He directly contributed to the development of bomb warfare during that time and was quoted as saying, the only thing the Arab understands is the heavy hand. Harris developed an interesting set of opinions and personality during this time. He came to have low opinions on naval officers, saying, I quote, There are three things which should never be allowed on a well-run yacht, a wheelbarrow, an umbrella, and a naval officer. And in addition to this, Harris came to the conclusion that multiple and continuous bombing runs could solve all number of problems, with another infamous quote in regard to the Palestinian Arab revolt in 1936 stating, One 250 pound or 500 pound bomb in each village that speaks out of turn would satisfactorily solve the problem. When the Second World War hit, Harris was one of Britain's most experienced pilots and was commissioned to lead the RAF Bomber Command. By 1942, he was directed to carry out the area bombing directly Directive, which was a strategy that entailed bombing on the German industrial workforce, as well as the bombing on German cities and their populations. Harris, a firm believer in the area bombing strategy, quoted at the start of the campaign, The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everyone else, and nobody was going to bomb them. At Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put their rather naive theory into operation. 
They sow the wind and now they're going to reap the whirlwind. And with that, Bomber or Butcher Harris began to earn his nicknames. In May of 1942, he innovated the first thousand bomber raid under the name Operation Millennium and devastated the unexpecting city of Köln. The end result of the raid was over 45,000 Germans made homeless and 469 killed. The industrial parts of the city were rendered effectively useless and the Brits came away losing only 40 bombers, a mere 4% of the total force. This raid on Köln, however, was just a fraction of what was to come, and in another one of Butcher Harris's operations, codenamed Operation Gamora, the German city of Hamburg was targeted. This time, however, the area bombing directive was put into full practice, and in eight days of non-stop bombing, with the Allies using the newly innovated firebombs, an estimated 34,000 to 43,000 died, and the entire city of Hamburg was ablaze. The extent of the damage would later be compared to Japan, with many calling it the German Nagasaki. Harris was triumphant, and this continued to show him that the war could in fact be won through bombing, bombing, and more bombing. His political contemporaries, including Winston Churchill, however, were coming to disagree with the methods promoted by Harris. Churchill was under immense political pressure and still maintained that the area bombing directive was intended for specific industrial and economic targets. Harris, however, emboldened by his recent success at Hamburg and frustrated with Churchill's hesitance to endorse his tactics wholeheartedly, urged the government to be more transparent as to the true nature of the bombing campaign. To quote Harris once again, The aim of the combined bomber offensive should be unambiguously stated as the destruction of German cities, the killing of German workers, and the disruption of civilized life throughout Germany. The destruction of houses, public utilities, transport and lives, the creation of a refugee problem on an unprecedented scale, and the breakdown of morale both at home and at the battlefronts by fear of extended and intensified bombing are accepted and intended aims of our bombing policy. They are not byproducts of attempts to hit factories. Due to Harris's close circle of political support, the area bombing directive stayed active. However, although Harris wanted to replicate his successes of Hamburg on other cities like Berlin, the Germans became all the more wise to the strategies used by the RAF under the command of the Butcher, and in the attacks to Berlin between November 1943 and March of 1944, the results spoke for themselves, with the British losing over 1,000 bombers with a further 1,700 damaged. During D-Day, however, much to Harris's dismay, he was forced to pause his operation on Germany and was ordered to switch targets to France for the time being. After this hiccup, however, Butcher Harris continued his campaign, bombing many industrial and civilian targets, specifically in the city of Rue, where he aimed to halt German oil production. He was awarded the American Legion of Merit for his bombing campaign there, as American official history notes state that Harris was ordered to cease attacks on oil in November of 1944, as the combined bombing had been so effective that none of the synthetic plants were operating effectively. In one of his last and most controversial raids of the war, Bomber Harris Harris targeted Dresden, where yet another firestorm caused extremely heavy casualties, with an estimated 25,000 victims. As Germany was falling, Harris was criticized for ordering raids on places such as Plotzheim for little to no military value and needless civilian deaths. His bombing campaign lasted all the way up until April 23rd, 1945, just as the Soviets were knocking on the gates of Berlin. And as a result of this, Harris was also awarded the Russian Order of Suvorov First Class, as the 10,000 German anti-aircraft guns could have easily been redirected to Soviet tanks and ground forces. Something the Soviets appreciated didn't happen. After the war, Harris was well aware of the controversy he garnered all across the world, and although he received medals of appreciation from Poland all the way to Brazil, many could not stomach the fact that his bombing campaigns resulted in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of German deaths. In response to this, I'll leave his final quotes from his post-war memoirs with you and let you decide. Harris wrote in these memoirs, In spite of all that happened in Hamburg, bombing proved to be a relatively humane method. I assume that the view under consideration is something like this. No doubt in the past were we justified in attacking German cities, but to do so was always repugnant. And now that the Germans are beaten anyway, we can probably abstain from proceeding with these attacks. This is a doctrine to which I could never subscribe. Attacks on cities like any other act of war are intolerable unless they are strategically justified. 
but they are strategically justified insofar as they tend to shorten the war and preserve the lives of allied soldiers. To my mind, we have absolutely no right to give them up unless it is certain that they will not have this effect. I do not personally regard the whole of the remaining cities of Germany as worth the bones of one British grenadier. 